Welcome, everybody, and thank you so much for being here. I'm Martin Hall uh, from the University of Salford, and it's my pleasure to be um, chairing this conference today um, and tomorrow. The organizers tell me that they had expected this to be a small in-house affair uh, with just a few people uh, in a room. Uh, it's completely sold out, and thank you all for making the time and trouble to come on what is a really uh, important uh, topic for discussion. Um, I'd like to thank uh, those who've made this meeting possible. Um, they're up there on the slide as the sponsors and supporters. <clears throat> in particular, uh, I'd like to thank the British Library uh, for hosting uh, this event at what really is itself <clears throat> symbolically uh, such an important uh, venue here in London uh, for the future of the book. Uh, and I'd like to thank OARPEN uh, and GIST Collections in particular for working so hard on putting together uh, what is going to be a really interesting program. Um, I wanted to um, make a few opening comments before I turn, first of all, to our guest uh, keynote speaker and to try and frame uh, uh, something of why this is such uh, an important topic uh, for us to be discussing. And I want to do that partly from my own uh, perspective uh, as an academic um, in the humanities and social sciences, in my case, uh, as an archaeologist. Um, my original speciality uh, was in the um, early Iron Age of the Zululand coast. You can't get more obscure than that if you try. Uh, and you try publishing a book on the early Iron Age of the Zululand coast, uh, taught at probably two universities uh, with a collection of maybe 15 or 20 colleagues Maximum print run, if you're lucky, 300. Uh, from the publisher, full color plates, please. Um, and on top of that, an affordable price, so everybody gets access to it. And the crisis in monograph publishing, in one form or another, has been with us, as many people here will realize, for certainly well over 20 years. Certainly, as far as I'm concerned, from the time that the great university presses began to lose the ability to provide the financial subsidies that made that sort of publication possible. And that, of course, was way before uh, we had any notion of what the digital age was or would bring. Um, of course, publishing in these sorts of areas um, is crucial for the advancement of knowledge. And what I learned in that, and many people here uh, will uh, have appreciated in their careers, is that in getting that sort of work out in monograph form, publishers were always our friends and our close colleagues. I've worked with a number of publishers in getting my own work out, which whom I've uh, learned to respect deeply. They've been passionate about the work. Without them uh, as agents, as friends, as participants, as, crit as critics, and as professionals, we never, as academics, would have published anything. And I think it's particularly important to hold on to that as we look uh, into the future and the way that we work into the future. Of course, some publishers, uh, in, in the course of uh, their professions, along with authors, have taken hugely courageous decisions uh, to publish and make work available, particularly in the arts, the humanities, and the social sciences. For example, uh, the courage shown in publishing uh, Robert, Ma Robert Ma Mapplethorpe's extraordinary uh, photography so long ago in the face of draconian censorship laws, which would have, in fact, stopped people having access to that art, was extraordinary and remains extraordinary. Just read through the difficulties and the controversies about bringing Salman Rushdie's work into print and the complex sorts of situations that publishers had to face uh, to make uh, perspectives available or, of course, not to make them available to us as readers. And that's the sort of environment, I think, that we all come from um, in the humanities and the social sciences. And then, of course, from the early 1980s onwards, we begin, began to see the growing momentum uh, of the digital world and the possibilities of digital publishing. Um, apparently, Bill Gates really did say 64K should be enough for anybody. I can remember on an early Apple II in the early 1980s being totally enthralled that if you put a six-letter code before a word and a six-letter code after a word, it would underline automatically. <laughs> we thought that was absolutely wonderful. Um, we had no particular notion then of exactly how that would transform our opportunities for scholarly practice. We now face a world where, effectively, there is no practical limit 
to the sort of the amounts of digital data that we can store uh, and transmit in practice no practical limit for us as scholars working in the humanities and social sciences the cost of that digital data storage and transmission is dropping all the time we have bandwidth virtually everywhere including in many parts uh, of the developing world uh, which until recently were cut off from the distribution of knowledge uh, when the price of a textbook published in America would be equivalent to the entire monthly salary, for example, of a lecturer at the University of Kenya. We are seeing the advent of what we can call thin clients, cheap, affordable mobile devices that virtually everybody can have. We're getting to a situation where the vast majority of the world's population will still have, soon have smartphones, and we are in an age of locational <coughs> intelligence. Our digital devices, if we let them, and it's very difficult to stop them, know we are, know where we are, know what we're doing, know what we're reading, and increasingly, and in a very alarming way, seem to know exactly what it is we want. So the challenge of this, I think, for scholarly publishing, which is what today and tomorrow are about, um, is to how to manage the transition. How to manage this very complicated transition from a former form of publishing, which after all, as I've said, has been in crisis for many years, into realizing uh, the possibilities of the future. Those, indeed, were some of the issues that we tackled um, on the Finch Group, and the next panel um, immediately after uh, our guest speaker will be about Finch. But there is a point that I need to make there, uh, and that is that Finch was about something rather different. Uh, the Finch uh, Group was convened by the Department of Business, Industry and Skills primarily to look at the possibilities for the economic return uh, from uh, publishing uh, and the way that the dissemination of knowledge through open access could in fact bring economic return particularly to small and medium businesses and enterprises. In other words, to get a return on investment uh, within the British and other economic uh, systems. The point about today's discussion is that it simultaneously is about the money, but it's not about the money. It's not about the money in the sense that um, there is a disproportionate relationship between the amount of funding that goes into the arts and humanities and their importance. In other words, if you look at any country's uh, funding systems for research and you look at the amount of money that goes into the humanities, it's a very small proportion of the overall science and scholarly budget. But of course, the humanities and social sciences have a significantly disproportionate effect on understanding our world and their importance in our world. Without things that are done in the humanities and social sciences, we won't know things that we have to know about the world, irrespective of how little that they cost us to do in relative terms. So this is a different uh, discussion. It's primarily a discussion about the significance and importance of monograph publishing in the arts and humanities for its own sake. But at the same time, of course, it is about the money, um, because if the money doesn't work, it's not possible to publish at all. And if the funding can't uh, be apportioned to the project in a way that enables that stuff to get out there, we're not going to see any publication. So it is about the viability of publication. It is vi about the viability of publishing in this digital age. It is about the viability of getting content out there in ways uh, that can uh, be exciting. And again, turning back uh, to my uh, background as an archaeologist, I find that particularly exciting as a set of future possibilities. Uh, one of the particular things about archaeology is we work with words, which can easily be translated into digital content, but we also work with stuff. We work with masses of stuff, shed loads of stuff, garages full of stuff. Uh, anybody who's seen what really comes out of an archaeological site would have seen the tons and tons and tons of dirty, broken pottery that we have an obligation to study, preserve for perpetuity, uh, and uh, write about. Now, very, very difficult to get that sort of stuff out there in conventional analog forms. And one of the reasons why people like archaeologists and classicists are so fascinated uh, by the digital revolution is that it gives us new ways of disseminating our stuff. And so digital publishing is not only just a substitute for conventional analog publishing. For disciplines like mine, it opens up huge new possibilities of sharing information in different ways either through high-resolution images that can be distributed online or through real-time live databases that can be embedded into publication, which means that people can interact with data in different ways. It also opens up possibilities 
for crowdsourcing and, and participation in academic activities. Archaeology is a discipline that attracts a worldwide following of amateurs, who in fact are the people who go off increasingly with their GPS devices and their mobile phone cameras and find new things. Getting into a digital world of publishing opens up possibilities for that information to be embedded within our scholarly exercises. So the possibilities in front of us for getting it right for monograph publishing and open access are not only about substituting for the loss of the conventional book, they're also about the possibilities that come from different forms of digital representation, different forms of digital dissemination that will ultimately and are immediately make the scholarship better. We can be better at it through enabling these devices. So that's some of the background um, for the sorts of discussions uh, that uh, we are going to have today and tomorrow and why I think uh, they're particular, particularly important. Um, I would now like to uh, hand over to our keynote speaker, Jean-Claude Guedon, from the comparative literature at Montreal, but in particular, and his biography is uh, in, in your pack, uh, very distinguished uh, by being uh, one of the signatories of the Budapest Open Access Initiative back in 2002, which was certainly a formative milestone in the road towards open access that's been rightly acknowledged uh, for its foresight and its importance in steering us uh, on this journey, and it's a particular pleasure uh, to have him with us this morning. <laughs> 